Well, good morning, Southside. Special welcome to our guests, anyone who's visiting with us for the first time. We're grateful to have you here with us to worship our God. What has been said today, we'll be sharing the Lord's table together at the end of the service. And so I have a special sermon to bring us to the table and help us to remember the one whose body was broken and whose blood was spilled out for us. Afterwards, we're going to be having a fellowship. And I just want to remind you again, the goal of these fellowships is, is one anothering, how to encourage one another in our walks with God and, and pray. And, and so just that's the focus, not the food. The goal is it's just, we used to call this filler when I was growing up. It's just a sub sandwich. We're not, it's not going to be extravagant. So I just want you to set your minds on just come. The, the, the focus is going to be Christ and one another, and you, you get to eat a sub if you like those, but um, that is what it is going to be. So let's continue then uh, to worship through the Word of God now and then at the Lord's table and ask that He would bless our time. Father, I thank You for the gift of Your Son. I thank You for the gift of Your Holy Spirit. It was good that He went away, that You would pour out Your Spirit who would mediate the very presence of Christ to Your people. I thank You that now by faith, Lord, we have a union with Jesus Christ through your Spirit. And I thank you that this Spirit inspired a, a, an eternal divine Word. He manifested your plan, your purpose, a revelation of who you are and your program. God, I thank you that's recorded in a book perfectly and that now we can uh, rest on it, lean on it, believe in it, and hope in it. And so I pray now that you will take these inspired words and that you will work and illuminate them into every mind and heart. God, do what only you can do now. Put Jesus Christ on display and let his glory fill this place. I pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, last week we began Romans chapter 7. Um, if, if I don't get through it this week, verses 1 through 6, I'm going to have a new elder read it next week. <clears throat> so <laughs> turn to Romans 7. And if you'll just look back to Romans 6, 14, for sin shall not be master over you. Why is sin not going to rule and reign the believer? Because you're not under the law, but you are under grace. There's a way that we can come under grace and the dominion of sin then can be broken by this relationship. And so now Paul is taking that statement and he's unfolding it. Uh, how can we come out from under law and not live lawless? How do we not just become anarchists? How, how do we bear fruit for God and honor him with our lives when we come out from under law? And that's what Paul is answering for us in chapter 7 of Romans. So last week, we only got through verses 1 through 4. And this morning, we're going to finish up this first section and we'll look at verses 5 through six. So let me just review with you last week. <clears throat> Our outline in verse one is, is an axiom. Here's Paul's foundational truth. Or do you not know, brethren, for I'm speaking to those who know the law, which would be Jewish people, it would be any Gentile convert, they, they would know the law. And that the law has jurisdiction over a person as long as he lives. And so that was our simple truth. And then we moved to the analogy that Paul used in verse 2. And he uses an illustration of, a, of a, a woman who, if she's married and she, she leaves her husband and remarries, she'll be called an adulteress. But if her husband dies, she's no longer bound to the law and she would be free then to remarry another. And so Paul has just been working that analogy for a very specific reason. And his main point was how can we be released from the law? A death must release us from it. And it's as, it's as much as a death of a husband. And so now as the pe people of God, we're free to remarry. We're not married to the law anymore. We're not under that, that covenant. We come out and we are now free to be married to Christ. And if you'll look with me then in verse 4, as we began looking at the application in verses 4 through 6. Therefore, here's my application, my brethren, believers, you also were made to die to the law. You died to that law. How did I die to the law? Through the body of Christ. When you believed you were joined to Christ 
And he came and he fulfilled that law. He, he, he obeyed its, its commands and he died for all the transgressions against that law that we had committed. And so when we, by faith, are joined to Christ, we're done with the law. It's, it's finished. Jesus uh, brings us out of it and we have died to it. And so how do I not become lawless if I'm not under the law? I've got these 10 commandments and all the things under that law. This is dangerous teaching to come out from under that. What's going to happen? Lawlessness? Paul says just the opposite. The Hina clause for the purpose that you might be joined to another, that you might be married to him who was raised from the dead, and that we are now joined to Christ in this new covenant, in this marriage to him, and what he's accomplished to fulfill the law. He now brings us into this relationship, and he gives us this, this another reason. What is the reason? The, this is the Hina clause. I messed that up. The Hina clause is in order that we might bear fruit for God. So there's a way to be married to Jesus, come out from under law, and it doesn't produce lawlessness. It actually produces holiness. It produces fruit for God. This is how God gets holiness in the believer's life. This is how he changes and transforms our life. And as long as I've been a minister, almost everyone runs to the law when they think, I want to get holy. I got to go to law to get holy. And Paul says, you died to that, that you might be joined to Jesus Christ for the purpose of fruit bearing. Well, let's continue this morning on flushing that out on Paul's application in verses 5 through 6. And in verse 5, for while we were in the flesh, the sinful passions which were aroused by the law were at work in the members for our body to bear fruit of death. So notice it's a four. It's explanatory to explain this idea of being joined to Christ to bear fruit. He's going to explain it more. But now in verse 6, we have been released from the law, having died to that by which we were bound, so that we serve in newness of the Spirit and not in oldness of the letter. So he's going to flush it out now, verse 4, and he's going to start by showing the bad marriage, the marriage of us in our unredeemed state. When we are married to the law, all it produced is bad fruit. It was the worst marriage there's ever been. Never been a worse marriage. And then he's going to say, but now there's something sweeter that, that we have this beautiful marriage to Christ, and that's going to bear really, really good fruit. And so two just examples that he will now look at in flushing it out. So let's go to verse 5 and look, simple outline. We're going to look at a bad marriage, and we're going to look at a good marriage this morning. <laughs> our, our bad marriage, verse 5. For while we were in the flesh... And so what, what does that mean? Is, is, is flesh, it can mean several different things, and it can even sometimes mean your skin, the skin over your bones, and that is not what he's talking about. All the context here is going to be spiritual and ethical. And so in the flesh, whenever we see that phraseology in Romans, it always, every time, refers to our unredeemed human state. What we were in Adam when we were unsaved, when we were in our lost condition. So when you hear in the flesh in Romans, you know that's what you were outside of Christ, outside of the Holy Spirit, in the flesh. So when we were in the flesh, it's when sin ruled and reigned over us. And so as Paul's talking about while we were unbelievers, when we were in that depraved condition, it's back to Romans 1 through 3 that he described so well that condition of lostness and just separation from God and the fruit that comes from that. So while we were in that unredeemed state, we were producing fruit for death. We, we, we couldn't live godly lives. We couldn't fulfill the ultimate, what the law was commanding. We, we, what did Jesus say? What's the greatest commandment? To love God um, with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and your neighbor as yourself. And upon these things hangs the whole law. So the whole law hangs on these two, what I call the law of Christ from Paul in 1 Corinthians 9. And so under this unredeemed state, the law calls for even the Ten Commandments to, to love God and to love other people with each tablet. And so we, we couldn't do that. We could only do it externally, but not from the heart. You could not fulfill the law's demands. So my question this morning, so what happens when the law comes and meets flesh, a heart like that? What, what's going to happen when those two come together? Well, what happens is, is sin 
is going to use the law as an instrument to actually produce more sin. So the law is going to come and command holiness, but when the law is given to us, it comes to these bad hearts in the flesh, and it just produces more sin. It, it, it produces the opposite of what the law is requiring and commanding of you. The very thing the law calls for produces the opposite when it meets the sin in our hearts. Next week, we'll iron this out. And I, I think it's become some of my favorite verses next week. But Paul says that the law said, don't covet. And all of a sudden, it started producing in me every kind of coveting. And we're, we'll unpack that next week. <clears throat> but the law comes and it demands righteousness. But the heart that it is commanding is a hard, fleshly heart. And it takes the requirement of the law and it's, it, it, the sinful passions within us, it says uh, in verse 5, it arouses them. It arouses them. The Greek word means to stimulate, to provoke. So that it comes and it says, be holy. And all it does is arouse sin. It stirs it up. It stimulates it. It, it produces more. So I, I, I always love that the, the problem with our, our society is we've taken the Ten Commandments out of schools. <laughs> that isn't true. Ten Commandments just stirs it up and makes you want to do the opposite. And I want you to listen to this this morning, and we're going to flush it out in Ephesians, how to parent your children in light of this. But the Greek word is, is stimulate, provoke. It's just this deadly dynamic within a heart. Law and unsaved hearts produce fruit for death. You take the holy standard of God, the law, and it comes to a heart that is unsubmissive to it, and, 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 and it tells you, do not sin. And, and the fruit of it is it just provokes and stimulates and stirs up more sin. And yet we're always rubbing our face up against the law to clean ourselves. That's why last week, 1 Corinthians 15, I mentioned, he, Paul said, the power of sin is the law. The law is sin, uh, sin steroid. It's performance enhancing drug. The law is a greenhouse. The law coming to this kind of heart does not produce obedience, but more sin, and Paul's going to say exceedingly sinful. It's just going to bring out more. I remember this is, I hate to admit this, but when I was a kid, one Halloween, I came to this house and I, I used to go out early with a big pillowcase to get as much candy as possible. And there was this big bowl of candy and it just said, we're not here, please take one piece of candy. And it, it, it just aroused my sin in every way. And I, I took the whole bowl. I didn't even leave, I didn't leave any for any other trick or treaters. I poured the whole thing in my pillowcase and, and walked away rejoicing. But when I walked up there, I just wanted one piece of candy. And when it said, just take one, it's just aroused and said, I'll take the whole bowl. I'm sorry, kids, your pastor's a jerk. <laughs> the law commands to an unsaved heart in the flesh. And when it comes, it's like smacking a hornet's nest with a stick. Boom. That's the dynamic. That was our marriage to law. And it commanded all the right things. But our hearts were just aroused to sin. Back to Romans 5.20. The law came in so that the transgression would increase. But where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. There's a purpose for the law. It's to increase it, just like I'm telling you. And there's a divine beauty of why it's going to increase it. So that grace could swallow it up. <laughs> And bring us under that beautiful thing. So law is not an inhibitor of sin. It's a provoker. And Paul's whole point in chapter 6 is that the law comes and it demands righteousness. And it meets our sinful flesh. And the fruit is always bad. In Romans 6, he, he said it was the fruit of death. It brought dead works. And it ends in eternal death. So that the fruits under the law just smell and they're destructive and they will lead you into eternal damnation. That's the fruit of the law. It just brings rebellion. Well, pastor, why is that? Why, why does it produce that? And, and Paul's going to answer that a little more detailed in Romans 8. So if you'll flip over to Romans 8 verse 5, I want to show you why this happens this way to our hearts. 
And I hope by the time we get here in a year or so, you'll forget what I said. <laughs> Romans 8, 5. For those who are according to the flesh, what's that? In the flesh. For those who are in the flesh, uh, unbelievers, what do you do? You set your mind on the things of the, of the flesh, your desires, your lusts, your wants. But those who are according to the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, the things of the Holy Spirit, the mindset on the flesh is death. That's been Paul's whole message. But the mindset on the Spirit is life and peace. Because the mindset on the flesh is hostile toward God. There's, there's enmity toward God in the flesh. For it does not subject itself to the law of God. Here's law of God commanding it, and it, it won't subject itself. It won't come under it. Why? It's not even able to do so. It's impossible. An unbelieving heart will never joyfully submit under God and his commands. And those who are in the flesh, conclusion, cannot please God. You will never be able to please God by trying to obey commands, laws, rules, ordinances. You cannot please him in that state. You will not bring that heart under God. So if I had to summarize what Paul is saying in this verse, this is big, so wake up. Sin is not so much that I break specific laws of God. It is. It is not, let's go over the Ten Commandments and I'll show you where you broke every one at one point. It's deeper than that. And that, that is not my main problem. My main problem, yes, I broke certain demands of God's law. Uh, if, if that was my main problem, I could just work at, okay, I'll work at obeying some of them. But Romans 8 is telling us that our main problem is that we are hostile to God. And I don't want that to go by easily. You, you are at enmity with your creator in the flesh. The sovereign one. This little puny human. I won't submit to you, God. You're majestic and holy. And I'm my own God. I'll call the shots. At the core of my being while I'm in the flesh, I don't want to submit to God. I have an unwillingness to be told what to do. I'm the captain of my ship. I will not be told how to live my life. I hate that. I won't submit to a God telling me to do that. That's my problem. And it's a massive problem. And some of you can hide it. And some of you are outright. You can hide it in religion. There's a lot of ways to hide this enmity that you have toward God. But without the law, you can smile and just say, I love God. I hear it every day in our day and age. I love God until it says abortion's wrong. It's murder. Homosexuality is wrong. Immorality is wrong. Marriage is between a man and a woman. You're born male or female and never the twain shall meet. And what comes out is massive rebellion. But the rebellion is that I won't be told what to do if you get to the root of it. And my flesh is aroused. And now I actually want to do these things more when it comes. Remember the garden? Don't eat of that tree. And the devil says, is that true? And you'll become like God. And, and all of a sudden, God's held out on us. And we will determine what is best for us. And I will eat of that tree. And you brought all of humanity into destruction. So I want you to hear this. My problem while in the flesh, it's not so much that I break laws, but that I hate laws. Because at the core of my being, I hate the lawgiver. That's what we got to be saved from. That's why changing your conduct will never fix what's on the inside. But without God telling me what to do, my sin can actually lie dormant. We're, we're still sinning, but it's when you're told not to do something that it just brings it up. So we're right back to Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. I want to be God. I want to suppress that there's a God. I want to be worshipped. I want to be made much of. My whole life is about me. Uh, Self-deification. I'm God. And we want to determine what is right and good and profitable for us. What will make us happy? I got my own ideas. I'm going to do what I want. That, that's just humanity since the fall. 
And we see it all over. You can, you can see it in a toddler, little toddlers. You can't have that cookie. Yes, I will have that cookie. <laughs> it's like pastor's Halloween candy. I'll go <laughs> grab it. You can tell a teenager that he can't do, well, anything. <laughs> I can make my own decisions. You tell me one thing, you can say, do 20 things and tell me one thing I can't do. I have no freedom in this house. (laughs) Tell a man who wants to run his own sexuality to leave a relationship and you'll quickly see his heart. And so I just want you to get this this morning. This is remaining in us as well as believers. We still fight this as a hangover. Our problem though, when we were in the flesh, unbelievers, We did not love the lawgiver. We hated him. And the remedy from last week for that is you got to die to the law. And you got to be married to the lawgiver and have as a father the God of the universe so that from the heart now will flow a whole new desire because you have a whole new desire for the lawgiver. All of today, we, we, we deal with the root of the flower of sin. The root is I need a new heart that loves God. And if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. So it isn't just, I work and I try to quit doing these bad things while my heart isn't changed. That's where we're going to go this morning. You need a new heart, a heart that loves the lawgiver because of Jesus Christ hanging on a cross in your place. The commands won't meet with the same rebellion any longer with this gospel. You're able to obey God for the first time And I've said it again and again in Romans, you have freedom. And that's what God does in this gospel. So while you're in the flesh, it was a bad marriage. And it just produced the fruit of death. And no moral resolve, ask the Pharisees. No cleaning up, no moving the furniture around, changing your idols could get you out of this marriage to the law that said, obey this perfectly and live. This condition of law producing more and more sin in my heart couldn't be fixed in my own strength. Matthew says that you, that you, you come and, and, and the demon is in you and he leaves and you clean up your house and you sweep it up. You know what that's called? Moral resolve, moral fix yourself up. And he comes back with seven more spirits and the case, the, the standing is you're worse off than you were before. You come into the law and church and morally clean yourself up without being saved and you're going to be in a worse place when you're done. You'll become a Pharisee and you will kill Jesus when he comes in the world and tells you you're a sinner. That's what it will happen in the flesh. Anyone here this morning tired of going from church to church and study to study, and new rules to new rules, and friends to friends, and commitments to new commitments, only to see yourself getting worse and worse. And I declare with all my heart, the solution to your loveless heart is not the law. And you've tried to change it again and again and again, moral resolve, new resolutions, and you can't change because your inside isn't. Saying justification, it doesn't matter if I'm the same old Gus. I've heard this too many times. Justification changes you. And you can attack your preacher and you can continue to be loveless. But I'm telling you right now with a loveless heart, church, theology, practice, service, can't change that heart. And I'm praying this morning, And maybe you'd be tutored to Christ instead of running to the law to keep changing your life and fixing. I have such good news for you. There's a way to come out from that life. You have to come out from under the law and there's a way to come out. There's a way to get out from the worst marriage ever. But there has to be a death. And faith in Christ who fulfilled the law's demands so that you can be joined to him in the best marriage ever, so that you can bear fruit for God. And now in verse 6, that you can serve in the newness of the Spirit. Let's take a look at verse 6. You know my two favorite words in Scripture, and Paul had to go and use them again. Gets me a little bit excited. But now, you were in this terrible marriage 
There was nothing you could do to get out from under it. But now God has done something to bring you out from under law. What did he do? Having died to that by which we were bound so that we serve in the newness of the spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. So are you starting to think that Paul really means it? Romans 7, 2, you die to the law. Romans 7, 4, you're made to die to the law. Romans 7, 6, having died to that by which you were bound, the law. Romans 6, 14, you're not under law, but under grace. And I have people say to me all the time, I wish Paul would have just made it clear that we're not under the law. He should have just said it. (laughs) Stop. We've been released from the law, from its condemning power, from its controlling power and its commanding authority. We've been released from the Mosaic law. It's ready to disappear. It's fulfilled. And now we're joined to Christ in a new covenant marriage. Not a list of rules, but a beautiful person who's God. A person fully God who has fulfilled the law. He gave us a picture of what a true son of God lives like, looks like, and acts like, and thinks like. You want a standard? Go look at the son of God. Righteousness incarnate. The demands of God lived out before us on this earth by the God man. He's the standard. He's what I look to and run to and try to walk in his footsteps. Thank you for something better than two tablets. Jesus Christ. And he puts me in a marriage with him. My goodness. So that. So that what? So that we serve in the newness of the spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. So let's dig in. We have died to the law, we're released so that we bear fruit for God and we serve in the newness of the spirit. That is not let us sin because we're not under law, but rather let us bear fruit for God and serve God and others because we're joined to Christ. And that is what happens when you come out from under law, not licentiousness. And here Paul brings in something new now that he hasn't talked about. He adds the Holy Spirit in this verse. And so where we're moving this morning now is this promise of a new covenant. This is one of the, the whole new te- Old Testament is moving to this promise and pointing and guiding us to it. And the role of the Spirit and the new covenant, I've said this so many times, is to be a floodlight to shine on Jesus Christ. And so the Holy Spirit's going to come and he's just going to shine that light on Christ and all that he is. And so the Spirit, through the Word of God, that Jesus says, I'm the fulfillment of the whole Bible. You see him, and now you love your husband. In order that fruit bubbles out of this sweet marriage, as the Spirit reveals these great truths to you from his Word that we've been studying in Romans. And that is how the new covenant works, and that is how God transforms and changes lives. So what we have before us then is the whole promise of the new covenant in the Old Testament. And that is what the Bible has been moving towards in this unfolding story. So how I want to close out is I want to look at two Old Testament passages and then one New Testament one, and then we'll go to the table together. So if everyone will flip over to Jeremiah 31. I want you to see where all this is coming from. It's a new covenant, but it has been being told all the way through the Old Testament. And so it's new in time, but it's been talked about, promised, and prophesied, and shown through the whole Old Testament. So let's start in Jeremiah 31, 31. Jeremiah, behold, days are coming, and those are the days we're living in right now, my friends, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, Not like the covenant which I made with their fathers in the day I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. So it's that the Mosaic covenant. And it was my covenant which they broke. And listen to this. Although I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. They they had God as a husband. He always gave them the motivation is because I've brought you out of slavery, I've delivered you, I will be your God. I mean, he's leading them out. They have this one who's like a, a husband to them. And their hearts still just take law and rebel and fight against it. But this is the covenant then that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. 
I will put my law within them. And on their heart, I will write it. And so I'm going to take this from the external command and I'm going to take it to the internal. I'm going to get it right into your hearts because what's your problem? Your heart. Your heart is rebellious to God's law. So I'm going to change your heart and I'm going to come take that law and I'm going to put it right within so that now you desire, you want to be submissive to God and his commands and his will. So I'll put them in the heart and I will be their God and they shall be my people. Relationship, new covenant. You're going to be joined together, adopted. And they will not teach again. Each man his neighbor and each man his brother saying, know the Lord for they will all Know me from the little ones that were baptized last week to the, to the greatest of them. They're, they're going to know me, declares Yahweh. For I will forgive their iniquity and their sin I will remember no more. And there's the promise of the new covenant. Your sins can be forgiven and your, your iniquities can be remembered no more. That's coming out from under law where you just remember your iniquities and now under the new covenant, I, I was really enjoying, I, I like when Jason drums, but he's got this little shirt on that in the form of a cross. And it just said, forgiven. I'm like, new covenant. So even your drummer's lost in the new covenant. So you can, you can be under the new covenant and still like drums. That's my point. <laughs> so our sins have been forgiven under the new covenant. But where's the Holy Spirit? In that, And so I want you to flip over to Ezekiel 36, the next uh, book. Ezekiel 36. And we're going to look at verses 26 and 27. <clears throat> so verse 26. Moreover, I will give you a new heart. And I'll put a new spirit within you. And I will remove the heart of stone, and that's in the flesh, the enmity of God in that heart. I'm actually going to remove that. And I'm going to give you a heart of flesh. I'm going to put within you this tender, sensitive heart now that loves the lawgiver. And I will put my Holy Spirit within you. And I'll cause you to walk in my statutes. I will bear the fruit of obedience from the inside to the out. And you will be careful to observe my ordinances. Amen? Flip over to 2 Corinthians where it's going to be interpreted now. 2 Corinthians 3. I'm going to start reading in verse 5. <coughs> So Paul's talking about, not that we are adequate in ourselves as ministers to consider anything as coming from ourselves, but our adequacy is from God, who also made us adequate as servants of, of a new covenant, not of the letter, but of the spirit. For the letter kills, which is what I've just described and explained to you. All it does is bring death, but the Holy Spirit gives life. But... If the ministry of death and letters engraved on stones, Ten Commandments, came with glory so that the sons of Israel could not look intently at the face of Moses as he would be in the presence of God and, uh, and he would come down. It says, because of the glory of his face fading as it was, how will the ministry of the Spirit, the new covenant, fill, fill fail to be even more with glory. So we're going to look at the glory of the beauty of the new covenant. For if the ministry of condemnation, which is the old covenant, so I want you to see, I, I love the description of the old covenant. It was a ministry of condemnation. It was to bring about seeing your sinfulness and condemn you. So if that ministry of condemnation had glory, much more does the ministry of righteousness that we've been studying in Romans for a year abound in glory. For indeed, what had glory, the old covenant, in this case, has no glory because the glory that surpasses it, where sin increased, grace abounded all the more, the new covenant just blows up and leaves the other one just behind. It's ready to fade away. For if that which fades away, the old covenant, 
was with glory, much more that which remains is in glory. And so therefore, having such a hope, we use great boldness in our speech. And we're not like Moses, who used to put a veil over his face so they, the sons of Israel would not look intently at the end of what was fading away, this looking at God's glory as if it fades. But their minds were hardened. Their minds were hardened for until this very day at the reading of the old covenant, the same veil remains unlifted because it's removed in Christ. And so we see the goal and the glory of the old covenant. We get it in, in Christ. So what, what was the purpose of the law? Don't turn to it. I will just read it to you from Galatians 3.19. Why the law then? Why did he give the law? It was added because of transgressions. Having been ordained through angels by the agency of a mediator until the seed, Jesus Christ, should come whom the promise had been made. Now a mediator is not for one party only, whereas God is only one. Is the law then contrary to the promises of God? If you get right by law keeping, isn't that contrary to a promise that comes by grace through faith? Paul says, may may it never be. For if the law had been given, which was able to impart life, if the Mosaic covenant was for you to obey it and get saved, then righteousness would have indeed been based on the law. That's how you would have got right with God. But the scriptures has shut up all men under sin, that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe the new covenant. But before faith came, we were kept in custody under the law, being shut up to the faith, which was later to be revealed. Therefore, the law has become our tutor to lead us to Christ, that we might be justified by faith. The law was given to stir up and stimulate sin and show you your sinfulness and that you can't fix it and you can't change it so that it would lead you to Jesus Christ as the one who did and the one who can save you and remember your sins no more. Oh, the glory of what the law pointed to and tutored us to. So why would you go back to the law? The law has been leading you and tutoring you to Christ. And Romans 3... 3.15, or 2 Corinthians 3.15. So it's, it's removed in Christ, this veil. So, and, and I want you to catch this. This veil is that you're trying to get right with God by your works. And there, there are just some of you sitting here every Sunday still doing that. It's a veil. And you just look at, I got to go work harder. I, I, I preach on this and some of you walk out and say, I got to go work harder. It's a veil. It's a veil. And this morning it can be removed in Christ. But to this day, whenever Moses is read the law, a veil lies over their heart. They can't get it. But whenever a person turns to Christ, the veil is taken away. The veil is removed when we turn to Jesus away from Sinai. It's taken away. And the question this morning, has it been taken away for you? And I pray that it has. Well, what is it that takes it away? Flip to 2 Corinthians 4.4. 4, and I just want to show you it's the gospel that removes the veil of the old covenant of works getting right with God. So in whose case, here's the veil. The God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelieving so that they might not see the light of the gospel, the glory of Christ. They can't see that glory. There's a veil that the devil has put over them. They can't see the beauty of what we're talking about. Uh, verse uh, six, for God who said light shall shine out of darkness is the one who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. The veil is lifted and you see the glory of Christ as the one, as the fulfillment of the law who came to redeem a people for himself. Looking at Moses and the Sinai covenant is a veil. You won't see glory. You'll just see rules and regulations. And you turn to Christ, living and dying and rising in your place. And there's salvation and no other name under heaven. And the veil's lifted. And you see the glory of Christ. We're a bunch of people who gather uh, overwhelmed with the glory of Christ. I can't make enough of Christ. You see it now. He is the only way to be saved. My hands can't do it. And what is that glory? Look with me in 2 Corinthians 3.18. 
But we all with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord Christ, are being metamorphosed. We're being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as from the Lord, the Spirit. So here's the whole design of the law. The whole design is why give a a law that just arouses sin so that it would be a tutor to lead you to this glory and that you would never take your eyes off of Christ. And you would be married to him and you'd see his glory and sanctification is going to come by looking and beholding and looking in this word and adoring who Christ is in order that you might bear fruit for God and you might serve in the newness of spirit with a new heart from the inside with whole new desires. That's the new covenant. Why? Being transformed into the same image. Loving, lay down your life kind of people that will not run out or burn out as you keep your eyes on Christ. Fixing your eyes on him, the author and perfecter of faith. Your Old Testament is so that you can see Jesus, not your rule book. What are laws and commandments to me now? They're ways to show me how to love Christ. I love commandments. I'm thinking of, I didn't get married to Laura. I, just, I, I didn't stand on the altar and just go, sweet, I get to keep vows. This is beautiful, man. Get, give me my vows. I'm going to keep them the rest of my life. That's part of it. But you know what I liked more than my vows? Laura. <laughs> just give me my rules. Give me my laws. I just, I just want to keep them. That's what I'm going to be about the rest of my days. I'm going to be a good law keeper. Let me have them. Let me refine my lists. Pastor, help me with my lists. No, I, I get the typology. Something better than Laura. I get Christ. And now I keep covenant because I love them. And I'm not, I, if, if you love me, you'll, you'll keep my commandments. Not keeping my commandments is love. And so I want you to to catch the glory and the beauty of the new covenant. The vows are for the relationship to let nothing hurt it. And we do the same with Christ. I love him and I want to keep his commandments from the heart. And when you fail, you keep short accounts and you repent and you confess sin and he's faithful and just to cleanse you from all your unrighteousness because he'll never divorce you. This marriage cannot end. Christ will make sure he brings you to glory. And so that relationship can be hurt by sin and I'm going to confess it and be forgiven and be restored to this sweet marriage. Don't hide. Don't, don't run away. Look before God and repent and confess your sin and be restored to, to walk in the spirit. And so I want you to, to, to catch that. It's a marriage that will make you happy forever and ever. So let me give you a big summary. Flip back to Romans. I hope you love being under a new covenant. And this is just finishing up then in Romans 8, 1 through 4. Therefore, there is right now for the believer no condemnation. For those who are under grace, I want you to hear that, there is no condemnation. The law was a ministry of condemnation. And you were under condemnation. The whole book of Romans 1 through 3 is you're under condemnation. And now there is no condemnation for the one who's come under grace of this new marriage with Christ. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus, new covenant, has set you free from the law of sin and of death. You've come out from that. You're not under law, you're under grace. For what the law could not do, weak as it was through the flesh, it couldn't change your heart. So God did it. How does he change your heart? Sending his son in the likeness of sinful flesh as an offering for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh so that the requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who are married to Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. So we're going to bear fruit now for God because we're not under law and his death brought us out from under it. This is just beautiful. It's on every page of the Bible. So our focus is not an outward code of law, but a spirit who's pointing us daily to Jesus Christ. 
And that will not produce lawlessness. It will not go against Christ and be a rebel. We will be conformed to Christ because we have his spirit and we will walk in newness of life to love him and to be conformed to his image. The law was given with a sword, disobey and die. And the new covenant was given with hands with holes in it saying, if you love me, keep my commandments. One is death, one is life. One was a letter with an outer demand. The old covenant, uh, the, the insides were just stimulated to sin. The Holy Spirit in the new covenant gives us new hearts with an inner disposition and a love for the lawgiver and desire to obey him and follow him. Love will flow out and into obedience. Law is not your need this morning, Christ is. And I pray that glory is just shining to see the glory of Christ and what he can produce in a heart. So one illustration as I close out, I've shared it 20, 22 years ago. So it's just as old, but I like it. There was this multimillionaire and he put an ad out in the newspaper back when they had newspapers um, for, for a maid. And this woman answered it and he hired her and she worked so hard. She cleaned, she did the laundry, she ironed, she cooked. And through time, though, the man began to be attracted to her. And they actually ended up falling desperately in love. And later they got married. And now that they're married, she does the same things. She, she uh, cleans, she does the laundry, she irons, and she cooked for him. But a, a different motivation. So we once were slaves to sin. And now out of our marriage... Service flows from love and gratitude. And all that that multimillionaire had became this little poor maid's. And so in Christ, we have received all of his riches. And so this is good stuff. I close with rock of ages cleft for me. Let me hide myself in thee. Let the water and the blood from thy wounded side which flowed. I love this. Be of sin the double cure. Save from wrath and make me pure. This Christ can save us from wrath and make us pure. Not the labors of my hands can fulfill thy law's demands as we just saw. These for sin could not atone. Thou must save and thou alone. In my hand no price I bring. Simply to thy cross I cling. And while I draw this fleeting breath, when my eyes shall close in death, when I rise to worlds unknown and behold thee on thy throne, Rock of ages, cleft for me, let me hide myself in thee. Let's, let's pray. Father, I thank you for the new covenant. I thank you that you've brought us out from under law in the most glorious way. And I thank you now that we're under grace and there's no condemnation and all our sins have been forgiven and you remember them no more. God, I thank you for this Christ. And I thank you now that we get to come together and come to the communion table and see the glory of the new covenant. To see the glory of Christ, who alone is the only way out from under condemnation, from under your wrath, into a loving, reconciled relationship. God, let us remember with full hearts and full minds now the glory and the beauty of Christ, I pray. Amen.